Okay. Is my voice coming from the TV? Ah, oh, there, okay. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of echoey. Sorry about that. Um, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening on a soggy Monday evening, as if Unga wasn't hard enough. The nature gives us another obstacle. Um, I actually got stuck in a coffee shop about an hour ago because of the Biden motorcade. Um, and I was due for another event, and they wouldn't, the cops wouldn't let anyone out of the coffee shop. So it was like interesting. Anyway, uh, we have more of that to come over the next couple of days. Um, my name's Robert Opp. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for UNDP. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here to UNDP uh, premises. And I just also want to start by thanking our co-sponsors for this event, our partners, um, GIZ and BMZ, uh, the German Economic Cooperation and International Development Agency. Um, we really have um, benefited tremendously from the partnership um, and really happy to be doing this event jointly. Um, so we're here to talk about data. And the issue with data, I was reflecting on this yesterday, on the one hand, we have a lot, arguably too much, in the sense that it gets a little bit difficult to deal with all the data that's out there. On the other hand, we may not have the right data. And this becomes particularly important when you start looking at issues like representation and diversity in data sets. And at one of our events yesterday in, in STG Digital, this point was made by uh, one of our, our um, guests who was from an organization called Indigenous AI talking about how artificial intelligence systems and the data that they're based on is not actually representative of their communities. So that's an issue as well. But it seems to, that, that no matter what angle we take on this, we can get better. And we know that policymakers around the world need support to actually be able to use data more effectively for communities and for the benefit of societies worldwide. And so this panel uh, is really about that. And over the last uh, year or so, we've done a lot of work together with our partners on talking to uh, national officials, uh, both policymakers, statisticians, and others about how can we really give policymakers the tools to work more effectively with data. Um, and that's really what we're gonna talk about um, in the panel. Um, the uh, issues here, I have to say, are mostly, the findings are mostly behavioral rather than technical. So I mentioned one of the things is we need more data in some cases, but a lot of it is about how people are behaving, um, whether they have the right mindset, whether they have the right skill set, and, and are able to really drive better decisions out of the data that they have. So um, I'm not going to kind of get it, because I know there's going to be a presentation later. I don't want to spoil the presentation of our data to, to policy navigator. Um, that's the sort of um, uh, heart of this presentation. But I just want to thank you all again for coming. Um, thank you uh, to our panelists. Um, we have panelists here from uh, BMZ from UNDP's Crisis Bureau and from the uh, UN Office for South-South Cooperation. I really appreciate your participation. Um, and, thank, and I'm going to pass you over now to our moderator, Mark Leon Goldberg. Um, Mark is, uh, uh, runs the Global Dispatches uh, podcast, and he is uh, the editor-in-chief of UN Dispatch. But I have to say, Mark, I did not see in your list of topics of current interest, digital or data? Yeah, I saw, oh really? Because I on your website, I did not find it immediately. So anyway, you can tell us what you've got there anyway. But thank you for, I'm gonna pass over, I'm gonna pass over to you now and thank you so much for your help with us this evening. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, I, I am a data for policy nerd, so. 
Uh, well, welcome everyone. I am really excited to be moderating today's event. And you know, this is, despite the gloomy weather, weather, a very auspicious day to be having this conversation. Not only is this the kickoff day of High Level Week, but as you all know, we had a big SDG summit throughout the day today at the United Nations. And you know, I, I caught a bit of it, and you know, those in the room know, of course, that we are nowhere near the making the progress we need on the SDGs. And Antonio Guterres had had an interesting line today. He said, we need a rescue plan for the SDGs. And I think our conversation today about helping policymakers use data better to catalyze the SDGs is certainly part of that rescue plan. So with that, let me invite the panelists to the stage. You can all come up and I'll introduce you after you sit. And then we'll, we'll, go, we'll go down the list, yeah. Here you go. So. So uh, Dima Al-Khatib, welcome. Uh, Dima is the director of the United Nations Office on South-South Cooperation. Uh, Charlie Elise Anderson is the leader of Intergovernmental Organizations and United Nations at Amazon Web Services. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Ilya Nikolt is Chief Data Science, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Welcome. And Dev, Ramia is Deputy Director, AI, UNDP Crisis Bureau. Welcome all. Well, I'll have a few questions for the panelists, then we'll open it up to the audience. So with that, let's get started. And we'll kind of go down the list, starting with Dev for our first question. I have the same question for each panelist to kick it off. Based on each of your experiences, why do you think that data is not sufficiently leveraged by policymakers? Go ahead, Dev. Uh, thanks, glad to be here. I think there are a couple of barriers for policymakers to use and leverage data. Uh, one of that is capacity and structural barriers. Often, I think data is considered to be in the realm of IT professionals or in the realm of statistical departments. Often there's a gap between alignment of the statistical departments and policymakers who are data consumers. So that's kind of the structural barriers that often exist. There's also kind of digital barriers where I think the capacity to use new sources of data and combine it with traditional data and to interpret it, to visualize the metadata for policymakers in order for them to interpret it and use it for policymaking. Those gaps, too, exist. And I would also like to flag maybe there is a political barrier. Sometimes I think we shouldn't be naive enough to think that just because there's good data, good analytics, means that the policymakers make the right policies. There are political expediencies and the lack of political will, which is sometimes a gap in spite of data and analytics. Yeah, I would like to continue on that, actually. I believe that we have to become better. We have to do better, um, really, because it's kind of following up on Robert's uh, opening. Because if policymakers are going to use data for their job, for policy making, then, then data has to make the decisive difference to not using data. So it really has to be uh, transparent enough for the public to ask policymakers to use data when doing the decisions. Uh, policymakers have a broad range of strategies. They can decide to, I don't know, uh, not decide at all, for example, that happens, or they can decide to just uh, decide on instinct or by chance. And if they are to choose data, then it has to make a decisive difference when, uh, according to the other strategies or compared to the other strategies. So basically, we have to provide the data that makes that difference. And we have to uh, provide it at the point where the decision is made. And this has to be communicated. This has to be open. That's my answer. Okay, thank you. Charlie. Um, so you started by saying, based on our personal reflections, where data has an impact. So I've only worked in technology for six and a half years. And prior to that, I was in operational law enforcement. And one of my biggest challenges was that we simply didn't know what we knew. And I think Robert's already touched on that. Arguably, there's too much data. Do we have the right data? Is there enough data? At Amazon, we see that data has gravity. It's fundamentally one of the most important tools that we have. The technology is 
already there. It's there for people to use. I believe that the barriers that have already been mentioned are accurate in so much as sometimes it's seen as an IT problem. Whereas actually, if we look at the use of data and the impact that it can have on policy, it's not. It's mission critical. It's about an organization's intention to do something, whether that's to drive change or protect security or whatever they may be. So the barrier, I think, is very much around political conversation, having difficult conversations, being willing to challenge the thinking, um, and then leveraging the data to go forward. Um, thank you. I think the colleagues have also mentioned all of these uh, uh, barriers that are real reality on the ground. I'm going to add one more thing. I mean, in addition to issues related to capacities, but issues related to the structural aspects, there is also the issue of culture. Right? Policy makers or sometimes the policy dialogue, they, they fear the data because they unveil the reality. And this is where it links to the political situations. I, mean, I come from a country where, for example, they fear to do a census because it will change the whole political scene. That is how powerful data is. But also the other thing which is extremely important is that we need to focus on is the power of data to change the scene of development. The SDGs framework is, is a framework of data and data analysis and data comprehension. And this is something that is in our hands. So this is my opening. Thank you. Thank you. you know, your point about the fear of data is important and relates directly to the question I wanted to ask you, Dev. You know, UNDP obviously works in, in crisis zones uh, around the world. What types of measures and regulations should be in place in terms of data privacy and protection so that when that crisis hits, you're able to guarantee the rights of vulnerable populations and respond effectively? In an ideal world, the starting point should be a strong data culture where there's willing to, willingness to embrace data for recovery, reconstruction, and rehabilitation and incentive systems to use data. Then also a governance and a regulatory framework that looks into privacy uh, of data, especially protecting the vulnerable and the disempowered, which is quite a common feature in crisis contexts, as well as informed consent in terms of data collection, as well as, I think, uh, data transparency and accessibility, where beneficiaries are not looked at only subjects of data gathering, but they are also embraced in terms of influencing active participants of policy making. But that's not the case. Often in crisis and fragile contexts, you really do not have the governance and the fundamental structures that speaks to it. So in those cases, humanitarian and development actors have a moral imperative to model rights-based approaches to uh, data and governance and privacy, and that's what we would do if I can throw into examples of and after con conflicts and crises, we do what we call the post-disaster needs assessments or the peace building and recovery needs assessments, which entails collecting lots of personal data, uh, individual data, land ownership, uh, including socioeconomic impact, etc. And in these situations, in addition to the regulatory, local regulatory frameworks, often it doesn't exist. UNDP does use its own guide rails in terms of anonymizing data, in terms of randomizing data, in terms of encryption, security, et cetera, which is something I think is an entry point for us to bring this forth to some of the governance structures on the ground so that it can take root. For example, Libya, as we speak, we are in the process of supporting Libya after the floods. And there's a fractured government. There's one side on the east, which is not under the recognized UN system. And we have to collect data from both sides. So when you talk about legislation, privacy, all of this becomes very complicated. There is another example where UNDP did a journeys to extremism in Africa, a study that looks at why people join violent extremism. Uh, in eight countries, sampling about 2,200 people, out of which 1,000 are voluntary 
as well as force recruits into extremist organizations. And initially, long time ago when this research was started, some of our partners were using, for instance, WhatsApp to collect data. Here, data privacy is literally a matter of life and death, right? So, that, so you, there are lots of safeguards and guardrails that we need to put in place. Uh, thank you. Your um, use of, of, of examples was very helpful, I think. And I also wanted to, Charlie, turn to you and have you describe some examples, uh, concrete ones, about how Amazon Web Services, AWS, has collaborated with governments to pull off data projects that governments probably would not have been able to do on their own. Um, thank you. I think the panelists already have touched on something really interesting. That's fear and catalyst. Invariably, when we see um, a change to policy and direction, something has happened. So if we go back to just prior to the invasion in Ukraine, there were a number of things that needed to be changed. Now, in some countries, legislation requires that data has to sit physically in a country's land, physically on soil. And as the warning signs for invasion began to build, the Ukrainian government made a decision to pass new legislation, new policy, to enable them to house their data somewhere that wasn't on the ground that would be subject to conflict. And then they put out a call for help. And AWS, amongst other companies, responded to that call for help. And we quickly deployed some, we call them snowball devices. You could think of them as very large USB sticks, incredibly large, hold huge amounts of data. We took those into the area and helped the Ukrainian government to pull their data into cloud-based technology. And this was incredibly important because this data was um, people's information. It was the land registry. It was financial information. It was everything that keeps a country operating. And as a result of that work, the Ukrainian government have been able to continue to serve their citizens despite the ongoing conflict. And that's led to us launching additional technologies around continuity of government IT. So I think for me, those examples where something happens, something significant happens, and the fear of that impact is when we really see the change to policy. I wonder, Dima, if the Ukrainian example might be the exception to the rule, that in fact, evidence-informed policymaking is indeed just deeply challenging at the local level. Yes, it's yours. It is indeed challenging, and it becomes even more challenging when we try to use the data to measure complexity, because it's not a, a straight line, right? I mean, we keep talking in the UN system also about what we call nexus, linking food, water, peace, uh, social cohesion. How do you measure that? How do you ensure that you are driving this data analysis towards an end that will be helpful to the countries. From what I would like to add to this question, and, and you know the colleagues have been mentioning all very pertinent uh, examples and comments, the countries of the, of the South that we are uh, looking after are also, you know, which is a big proportion of the countries of the globe, facing a lot of uh, challenges in terms of uh, addressing development issues. And by trying to support them with uh, you know, capacities and support to address uh, data analytics, uh, address complexities, let them realize the power of data in advancing development, I think we will be achieving a lot. Again, I mean, we talk about the SDGs. SDGs is a framework also of measurements, of targets, of uh, uh, and, and if we don't get that, we will not be able to, to progress, right? Uh, thank you. And Ilya, you know, it seems we're in this real transformational moment uh, in terms of just the availability of data, the, abil av the ability to process data. What excites you the most about this, this moment that we're in right now? <laughs> Except uh, the huge amount of data, the ever-growing amount of data, uh, the very much very very much excites me is the potential of uh, artificial intelligence at the moment 
because this is, I think, uh, something that's probably the most exciting thing happening in our lifetime. But it also has the potential to, I don't know, to, it's like, like if, if data is an ecosystem, then I think artificial intelligence is like the, the flower garden, if we play our cards right and uh, uh, address all these issues um, that are certainly there. Uh, but it has such a huge potential to explain data, to convert data from numbers to text, to tap into texts and explain text and, and, and um, work with huge amounts of text that we will not be able to understand and work as humans. So there is a lot that can be done if, if it's used the right way. Uh, so there's a lot of potential and there is risks. Uh, there are risks as well, no, uh, no question about it. But um, I actually use the AWS example um, in, in um, uh, some talks about um, leveraging risks and chances. And I believe that uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, the, uh, the chances are huge and the risks are manageable. I hope. So I'm going to enter the next question into ChatGPT as a prompt and have each of you uh, give your ChatGPT best answer, the prompt. Give a 60-second pitch on why data-based poli data policymaking is so fundamental in achieving the SDGs. Go ahead, Dev. First is leaving no one behind. It's about we need granular, multidimensional data not as a statistical imperative, but to disaggregate those that is most vulnerable and left behind if you're really going to lift the last mile out of poverty and vulnerability and to meet the SDGs, that's one. The second is SDG pathways. I think data is actually a tool for governments to chart new pathways to accelerate and reach the SDGs. Recently, UNDP did this 95 reports of SDG push which actually analyzes data, including using artificial intelligence and insights and intelligence and experience to see how governments can take different pathways. So these are two examples where data is extremely imperative and important if we are to achieve the SDGs. Thank you. I'm next, okay. Um, I believe that the problems are so multidimensional there just way over our heads, that we are not able really to, to reach the goals and to understand which pathway is the best to reach the goals. But we will make less errors with uh, using data when using data. That's actually not my quote, it's Babbage, but never mind, 200 years ago, <laughs> still it's still valid. We will, we will make less mistakes, and that's all we can do, uh, because it's going to be a very, very difficult goal or number of goals to reach, uh, and we have to do our best. Thank you. So I think it comes down to approach to risk and risk management, and I also agree that there is a very exciting future out there. I think it will be an absolutely incredible. I think the technology that we see now is undeniably the most powerful and influential technology of, of our generations that allows us to make sense of so much data, particularly when you look at generative AI, um, not necessarily ChatGPT. Um, but it comes down to our approach with risk management and our acceptance of balancing the risk and the trade-offs, making sure that we put guardrails in, safe, in place instead of preventing policy, but using those guardrails to guide us around policy making for the future. Yes, um, I'd add to the mix by saying I think we need to explore the multitude uh, typologies of data, not only the traditional ones. This is very important. And the foresighting, I think foresighting is an extremely powerful tool and that is something that, you know, countries can depend on in order to, you know, avert risks, prevent, look into, anticipate. and. There's a lot that can be done, especially for the climate agenda, in terms of looking at the data and trying to make sure that this is also grounded uh, in the national policies developments and implementation, but also the work of the whole UN system. Thank you. Uh, so we have some time for audience questions. Not too much time, so please keep your question short and identify yourself if you have a question. Yeah. I have a question. What did GPT say? I mean, you, you, did you type it in? So it what's the synthesized answer? all of your remarks before you ah. even made them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's a trick Are there answer. any any questions from the audience? If any, Helen, do we have questions from the um, from the live stream at all? Oh, we do. Yeah, there is one online question. Um, how can, well, I'll still introduce myself, Daria from UNDP, but how can general public influence or put pressure on policymakers to take a data-driven approach? Okay, a, a, a policy-focused question. Um, you, you nodded your head, that, so that was a good, a good question, Charlie. It's a good question. It's a good I wouldn't necessarily be the right person to answer that one. Okay, Dev, I saw you sigh heavily. <laughs> pass this to Rob. Okay, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> We can. <laughs> so it's a how to influence, general public can influence policymakers, right? I, I think, I need to think, right? Chat GPT. <laughs> no, actually what happens is I think uh, there are policy alternatives out there. So there's no one policy pathway for certain things. And I think where data comes in is that your ability to monitor things and adjust in real time and to have that transparency. And I think if the public is able to demand that transparency and accessibility to data, they can see any kind of deviations in policy making and understand why or question the policymakers or politicians of the change. Currently, there is no empirical evidence behind why policymakers choose certain policies or they decide to change certain policies. So I think that data transparency and accessibility will help uh, general public hold the feet to the fire of the policymakers. And, and Dima, go Civil society and elections. This is the moment where the public can put pressure on policymakers for evidence-based approaches, for data for policy development, and the like. This is the right uh, of the people, right? And civil society speak for the people. So they are the powerhouse of the people in every country. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much to our panels. It went fast, didn't it? OK, thank, thank you all. Yeah, you guys can go back to your seat. Thank you. I'd now like to call to the stage Alina Klatt, Global Project Manager of the Data to Policy Initiative at UNDP's Chief, Chief Digital Office to introduce the Data to Policy Navigator and video. Thank you. Do you want the mic? Yeah, I want the mic. Great, thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic, climate crisis, and conflicts with international ramifications are some of the global challenges that the world has been facing since the turn of this decade. They are staggering and in some cases, reversing the progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, which are now approaching their midpoint. Amid these challenges, data multiplies. Since 2015, data grew fivefold, flooding from satellites, social media, and telecoms. Investments in AI also surged tenfold. Leveraging these new data sources, can advance the SDGs across sectors. Yet limited access, resources, tech know-hows, and complex governance hinder policymakers around the world from using new data. To support policymakers with their data needs, the UN Development Program, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the UN Office for South-South Cooperation introduced the data to policy navigators tailored for government executives with limited data expertise. This tool, which simplifies how to identify data needs, access and analyze data, design and evaluate policy using data, build data capabilities and data culture, ensure ethical and responsible use of data. The Navigator also provides case studies and success stories where policymakers from countries like Mexico, Moldova, and Vietnam have used new data sources to improve lives. Now, you can too, no matter what sector you focus on. Simply go to datatopolicy.org, explore the navigator's step-by-step -step guide, and join the global network dedicated to data-informed policymakers. Together, we can use data to develop more effective, inclusive, and sustainable policies and turbocharge the SDGs. Oh, <laughs>
now you got a little glimpse into what the data to policy navigator and the network is. Um, but you may wonder um, how you can actually use that navigator either as a policymaker or I believe many here in the room work with policymakers. And in order to walk you through that or in order to answer that question, allow me to introduce you to a policymaker. Her name is Santi. Uh, she is a leader in the Ministry of Labor in her country, where she oversees um, a couple of policies in the area of labor and employment. As with many countries at the moment, um, the labor market in her country is facing severe challenges after the COVID-19 pandemic. She especially sees an increase in youth unemployment and her boss asks her to find a solution and to develop new policies that tackle exactly that problem. Santi, in her time during the COVID pandemic, has seen that data, especially during that time, actually helped develop or design better policies to fight COVID. We have seen data on more, um, people's movement, we have seen data on hospitalization rates. So now she wonders how can she actually use data in order to develop better policies to fight youth unemployment. She checks out the Data to Policy Navigator. Um, she first starts to look at the use cases because she's just wondering what is already out there. Um, she's specifically interested in economic development, given that is her area. And she finds one use case that is particularly interesting from Vietnam, where job vacancy data was used uh, to improve labor policies. She checks out that um, use case and she sees that the government of Vietnam actually used a mapping of the data ecosystem as the first step to develop that policy. She also sees that the government set up a task force to help manage this integration of new data into the processes. That's super interesting for her. Um, so she wonders how can she actually do that in her country. And that is then where the step-by-step -step guide comes in and she actually finds concrete guidance on how to set up a mapping of a data ecosystem. And she also finds concrete guidance on how to set up a task force on uh, integrating data into design, uh, into the policy design. When she's looking at the Developing Institutional Mechanism article, she finds also concrete practical guidance and just a couple of additional tools that she can use. Lastly, she's wondering, well, if I work with employment data, what is it actually that I have to consider from a data privacy perspective, given that that is sometimes quite sensitive data? Well, she could check out that article. There's an easier way, a more intelligent way. The chatbot that helps her answer that question. It's a chatbot that has been trained on data from the navigator and on related resources. She types in that question, she gets an answer as well as uh, a couple of additional resources that she can explore in order to dive deeper into exactly that question. So that is how Santi can use the navigator and how many other policymakers, hopefully around the world, can use it as well. We are very excited um, to have it online now in English, French, and Spanish. So please do check it out. Check out the chatbot. Um, we are very much looking forward to scaling and expanding the navigator together with our great partners from the UN Office of South, -South Cooperation, from the German Development Cooperation, and um, really also with many partners that we have here, as well as our great expert panel that has been with us from the very start of this journey and given great input. So if you're a policymaker or work with ones, check this out and let us know what you think. Thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Uh, I'd now like to invite Dima Al Khatib back to the stage for the launch of the Virtual Data to Policy Network. Well, thank you. I like the navigator, it's very nice. So we're also very, very happy today to launch the network, which is a virtual data to policy uh, network. And this will be hosted on our uh, famous Galaxy platform. This is a platform that hosts more than 900 best practices on South-South cooperation. 
And we thought that would be as part of this collaboration that we have uh, today with uh, BMZ, with UNDP, that this would be uh, a very uh, good nest for it. And it will help to harness new data types for more evidence-based policy making. It will generate actionable intelligence to shape more effective policies. It will work as a reservoir of cutting edge insights, good practices and tools, and will provide new opportunities for policy makers to connect with global experts and to connect with each other and to learn from each other. So not only the navigator will give solutions, but this will also provide an opportunity for creating this network among policymakers. So this is what it is, and we invite you all to, uh, to explore it and to be part of it and to advise your government about it, and uh, more to come, I believe. Thank you. Guyane, here we go. This for you. Let me pass the mic to Guyane. Here we go. Thank you. If uh, one thing perception data informs us, that is not to be the person standing between the audience and the food. So <laughs> I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I want to thank uh, a few entities and and few people. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, the, the event co-organizers, uh, GIZ, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and the UN Office of uh, South-South Cooperation, and also especially Dima, you and your team for the support for hosting us here in this beautiful location, uh, and also our volunteers, an army of volunteers who you saw at the Second Avenue and, and downstairs, and putting this event together, uh, and also speakers, the panelists. Thank you for the, for the wonderful panel. And Mark, thank you for the excellent moderation uh, of the panel. Really great having you here. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, there's, yes, there's people in this room, but to, to, to put together that Data to Policy Navigator, there were a panel of experts uh, who worked with us uh, on putting this together. And also um, the, the experts we interviewed in this process to, to get information about what's happening in their country. So um, I really thank them. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the, the link for this is live streamed, and also it will be available on the network that Dima announced as well. Uh, so if you register there, you'll receive the link to the, to the video, and it'll be available on the website as, as well. And uh, finally, let me thank all of you for turning up today amidst the, the, the bad weather today, but uh, really pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. And we please uh, feel free to enjoy the, the refreshments. Just uh, a quick reminder, I saw some wine glasses uh, at your feet, so we are going to move the chairs a little bit so you have time, uh, you have space to uh, walk around. Uh, please uh, make sure you have them. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a very good evening. <laughs>